Good evening. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Tina Pang. I'm uh, president of the Oriental Ceramic, Cer Ceramic Society in Hong Kong, and I'm delighted to welcome you all to this evening's lecture. I'm thrilled to be introducing Stefano Mariani, who heads the Tax and Trust Practice at Deakins, Hong Kong's oldest and largest law firm, and the first to establish a dedicated art law practice. He has a broad range of experience that we're thrilled he's uh, sharing with us this evening. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome Stefano uh, to speak to us on heritage and the arts in tax and estate planning. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tina. And thank you all for joining me this evening. Um, the purpose of this talk is to give a general skeleton or indication of the tax and estate planning opportunities that you might find in relation to what I assume for many of you is your favorite pursuit and pastime, that is uh, collecting and curating uh, heritage, antiques and artworks. And you'll be pleased to know that there is some potential here and Hong Kong has a uniquely favorable environment in that regard. That said, uh, Hong Kong isn't uh, the beginning and the end of the world, and there are certain considerations, especially when it comes to international matters, which you ought to keep in mind. So apologies if this is preaching to the choir for some of you. Uh, I'm conscious that many of you will be much more experienced and may well have professional backgrounds than others, but the purpose of this talk is fundamentally to be non-jargonistic and to discuss at a high level, just to give you some ideas as to the sorts of things you might want to consider. So may I just invite the moderator to move to the next slide. Again, this is our standard disclaimer. It's terribly boring, perhaps a tad defensive, but we have to include it. Of course, this is not legal advice, uh, but uh, let's make a start directly. First of all, a, a few definitional points. I'm a lawyer for my sins and therefore I like definitions. We'll begin by saying, what do I mean by artworks? Well, I use this as an all encompassing term uh, to include arts and crafts in all media. They don't necessarily need to be old and they don't necessarily need to be any good, uh, at least to one subjective taste. Uh, but if, I suppose it, as, 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 as the Greeks would say, you know, you know, kalos kai agathos, if it is, uh, if it is precious, it is beautiful. If it is precious to someone, it is beautiful in someone's eyes. So we're not here, we're not talking about aesthetic merit here. Antiques of all descriptions and collector's items. Uh, these might include stamps. Uh, I knew I had a colleague in, in London when I was still working there uh, who collected uh, I can't even remember what they're called. It's kind of a winch to pull out wax from um, uh, from, from candles. But anyway, it, all sorts of items are potentially collectible. And this might this would include wine too, wine and spirits, which are quite trendy uh, in Hong Kong. Uh, they, they're not particularly tax advantaged in Hong Kong. Before I go any further, well, wine and spirits can be tax advantaged in England especially if kept in bond, so uh, you don't pay excise duty and you don't pay value added tax on them and you can trade them in bond. In Hong Kong, there's, there's, not, there's not especially tax advantage to trade in wine and spirits. I mean, wine has currently has a 0% excise duty, that's about it. And I'll explain, I'll go into greater depth in a moment. Uh, by tax, I simply mean any government or public impost. Uh, tax is simply the government, whatever the government or a public body says you have to pay in order to not have to go to prison, in effect. Um, the, it, it is very trendy. I heard, I heard someone, well, I read someone uh, in the famously sort of left wing English newspaper, The Guardian, saying tax is the price we pay to live in a civilised society. Uh, which is which is frankly a rather pompous statement. Uh, tax is simply how the government funds itself and it can come in various forms and we'll discuss some of them here. Uh, trusts. Trusts are often misunderstood by laymen uh, and a trust is not a separate legal person. A company is a separate legal person in the sense that a company uh, can sue and be sued in its own name. 
A trust is not a separate legal person. A trust is a relationship for the holding of property. And usually the way a trust is configured is that a person known as a set law takes property, gives it to a trustee and tells the trustee to hold legal title of that property on trust for beneficiaries. And the beneficiaries are those who hold the beneficial title of the property. And if any of that sounds confusing, legal title simply means that is legal ownership. And beneficial interest of beneficial title of property means the actual right to enjoying the property. Right? So historically, trusts were, for, you know, for the sake of argument in the Middle Ages, uh, a man decides to go, because of course it's Middle Ages, must have been a man, and decides to go on a long journey or on crusade or to war, and he transfers his manor on trust so his wife and children can benefit in the event that he were to perish or never to return. So trusts are a convenient way of separating legal ownership and the day-to-day -day management of the property from the economic benefit of that property. And th this is an incredibly convenient and flexible tool in the contemporary world. And I'll explain why a little bit later. Finally, this Latinate term, lex citus, that simply means the law which applies to a given to a given act or a given piece of property. And the law could be Hong Kong, it could be English law, it could be Scots law, it could be Irish, it could be Russia, it could be whatever. Okay. And that's just to give you a sense of the principal ownership issues you might encounter uh, when, when you have transnational acquisitions or transnational loans. And I'll explain how this is relevant in a minute. If we can go to the next slide, please. Now, Hong Kong is a pretty good place in which to collect artwork or in which to invest in artwork or in which to build an antiques collection. That is because Hong Kong has no capital gains tax. Uh, gains arising from the disposal of capital assets are generally not taxed in Hong Kong. And let's demystify this term capital asset. What is a capital asset? Well, uh, capital is usually found in contraposition with income. Uh, income is something which recurs. Capital is something which is fixed. So uh, the analogy which is most often used and which I use with my students at Hong Kong University is, is capital is a tree and income is the fruit. Most advanced economies tax capital gains. So strictly speaking, if you buy if you buy an antique in, in England, if you buy a Ming vase in England, if you bought a Ming vase in England in the 1960s and sold it at many multiples of the acquisition cost in the early 2000s, then you would need to report that gain for tax purposes. And not so in Hong Kong. You must, however, be aware uh, that assets which we would ordinarily think of as capital in nature, such as immovable property, stocks and shares, and indeed artworks, may become taxable assets in Hong Kong if you are found to trade in them. That is, if you turn those assets over in the ordinary course of your trade or business. So the paradigmatic example I give you is, if you're an amateur collector and you buy and you sell, uh, that, generally speaking, is not taxable in Hong Kong. Taxable in England, taxable in America, not taxable in Hong Kong. If, however, you love it so much, you turn yourself in, into an antiques dealer and you rent a shop space on Hollywood Road and you start turning over these assets in the ordinary course of your trade or business, then the gains you derive from the sale and purchase of those assets will be taxable in just the same way that if you sell your home now, and make a profit, that profit is not taxable in Hong Kong. If Sung Hong Gay uh, sells uh, flats in Hong Kong, it is taxable because that's what it does in the ordinary course of its business. Hong Kong has no indirect tax, so there's no VAT, there's no GST, no VAT, we don't need to worry about any of that. Right? So there's no tax, indirect tax on sale. Right. And it's called indirect tax. For those who are wondering, it's called indirect tax because the taxpayer, that is the consumer, doesn't pay it. It's withheld at source uh, by the vendor, by the merchant. 
That's why it's indirect because the taxpayer doesn't pay it. It's someone who uh, is who contracts with the taxpayer who pays it over to the government out of the aggregate purchase price. Also, lovely in Hong Kong, we don't have inheritance tax, estate duty, death duty, whatever you want to call it. Uh, some will often tell you that estate duty in Hong Kong has been abolished. This is not technically true. The estate duty ordinance, that is the law which governs estate duty, is actually still fully in force. And if you don't believe me, you can go to www.legislation.gov.hk and have a look at that. It's fully enforced. The rate is zero, right? The rate of state duty is zero, but the estate duty ordinance is actually fully enforced, right? And it should be pretty obvious to everyone here why it's still fully enforced, because it can be resurrected at short notice if so required. Also in Hong Kong, we don't have any net wealth tax. That means you don't have to pay every year a given percentage of your net wealth. And you might say, what sort of barbarous jurisdictions charge net wealth tax? Well, Switzerland for one does. And it's not one of the usual suspects, but it does charge a low net wealth tax. Right? Other jurisdictions like Italy charge tax on an, an, a fixed tax on the ownership of immovable uh, property. Next slide, please. So Hong Kong being such a lovely place from a tax perspective, why you might be asking yourself now, why do I care? And why am I wasting my Thursday evening listening to this? Why should I care? Well, first caveat, and I do run into this from time to time, beware of trading. Because if you do something systematically for long enough, the revenue might take a proverbial punt and say, well, actually, you are chargeable to tax because you're not a collector, Mr. Jones. You are actually the antiques dealer in disguise. And we know this because it's because you buy and sell dozens of pieces every year. Therefore, we're going to tr try to charge you to tax. So you must be aware of this, because if you have a high volume of sell and purchase, the revenue can uh, jump in and say, oh, hold on, uh, you owe us some tax because we don't believe it's a capital gain. We believe this is a trading profit. It's a trading profit and therefore it's taxable. This risk is particularly acute if you buy and sell through companies. And that's because companies have to file annual tax returns in Hong Kong. So the revenue will know because they'll see the financial statements. They'll know how much the company has turned over. Right? Just because the revenue says so doesn't make it so. Uh, you have the right to appeal. You have the right to contest an assessment of tax made by the revenue. Still something to bear in mind and to be aware of. Another matter which I've dealt with in practice is uh, inheritance tax. There is none in Hong Kong, but just because there's none in Hong Kong doesn't mean you don't have to think about it. First of all, you might find that you are domiciled in the United Kingdom or some other jurisdiction which charges inheritance tax on non-residents who are domiciled there. The two, I'll explain what domicile is in a minute, but for the sake of argument and to, just to cover this point, there are two systems of inheritance tax. The first is the donor system, which is the system which prevails in England, where the estate of the deceased actually pays the tax. And the other system is the donee system, which prevails in civil law jurisdictions like France, Italy, Germany, and so on, where the heir receiving the legacy uh, pays the tax. Now, this is relevant because say that one or more of the heirs of an estate are resident in one of these jurisdictions which charges tax on a donee basis, they will be taxable upon receiving assets in Hong Kong in their jurisdiction of residence or domicile. So, I mean, I've dealt with this case, a high net worth individual in Hong Kong uh, had a daughter who worked in Paris. She had the rather nice job of, uh, of, of, of sourcing models uh, for, for the catwalk in Paris. 
right? And that was her job and she liked it. And she had both her parents are resident in Hong Kong, but she worked in Paris. And then her father unexpectedly died and she received a part of his legacy and both through a trust and directly. And that was taxable upon receipt in France. Right? irrespective of where the, the, the deceased was and where the estate was administered. So watch out for this. And where there are heirs or potential heirs resident in these jurisdictions, it's always a good idea to seek appropriate uh, tax advice, appropriate tax planning advice. If you have a trust, a trust fund, a trust to hold uh, your assets, a, a trust for estate or asset management purposes, beware but some jurisdictions do not recognize trusts. The reason they don't recognize trusts is because trusts are peculiar from a civil law perspective in that they separate legal title with beneficial title. And you remember beneficial title simply means the right to enjoy the property. So some jurisdictions don't recognize trusts uh, and you might want to be a bit careful with having assets in those jurisdictions or making or acquiring items in those jurisdictions uh, because the non-recognition of the trust may have may have implications both for ownership rights and for tax purposes. Right? So this is again something which needs to be ascertained, especially when investing in or when considering acquiring assets or loaning assets in a jurisdiction which is not a common law jurisdiction, which is not, you know, Hong Kong, Canada, uh, the United Kingdom, and so on. Uh, next slide, please. Following on from that, another thing you need to you ought to be aware of is the notion, the tension between forced airship and freedom of testamentary disposition. Generally speaking, and there is one exception, generally speaking, in most common law jurisdictions, uh, the deceased has freedom of testamentary disposition. And what, all, what that means is that one can make a will and you can disinherit anyone you like. The one major exception to that rule, both in England and Hong Kong, is that if you're accustomed to maintaining someone and that person is your dependent, you can't actually disinherit them entirely. You have to make a reasonable financial provision for those persons in your will. And if you don't, then those persons can bring an action uh, seeking a court order to have reasonable financial provision from the estate. And uh, generally, and apart from that rule, which is quite strictly construed, there is total freedom of testamentary disposition. The contrast, many civil law jurisdictions have so-called forced heirship. That means you cannot disinherit your wife or your husband or your children or your grandchildren, no matter how irritating they are and no matter how philistine they might be, you've got to leave something to them. And often the, 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 what you've got to leave them is very considerable indeed. One way in which my clients who are resident or nationals of civil law jurisdictions get around this is they create a trust. They create a trust and they put all their assets into that trust. And because the assets are then on trust, they're irrecoverable from the spouse and or children and or grandchildren. Right? Assuming, of course, that the jurisdiction in question, civil law jurisdiction in question, recognizes trusts. So at that point, you can avoid forced heirship. You can avoid having to give a part of your estate to someone to whom you are happily or unhappily married or, you know, your children, because for whatever reasons you might have, you don't need to justify it. Right? So that is one solution. But be aware of forced airship, because it is often the case that uh, certain individuals do not wish to leave certain assets or indeed anything at all uh, to their spouse and or children for reasons which, of course, belong to them. Also be aware of how much time you spend abroad, because the more time you spend abroad, the likely you are to become a tax resident in the jurisdiction outside of Hong Kong. And statistically, most jurisdictions are much less tax friendly than Hong Kong. So the last thing you want to do is to be fixed with a charge to income tax or capital gains tax and say France or Italy or Germany, 
just because you're spending a lot of time there. You also need to watch out for some jurisdictions having rules deeming you to be tax resident there if you have a permanent home there. So holiday home buyers beware. Again, none of this is meant to frighten or to badger anyone. The reality is, is that if you're well informed, then you keep uh, your professional advisors apprised of what you want to do, then all of these problems are easily avoided. All right, or relatively easily avoided was within reason. Now, evidently certain cases are more complex than others, but there is usually a solution where there is a proverbial will, there is a way. Confusingly, uh, tax residence and tax domicile are two different things in most jurisdictions, right? Domicile, in the way we understand it at common law, means the jurisdiction, the country with which you are most closely associated. Residence simply means the country in which you spend the most time in a given tax year, generally, all right? Domicile means where you have some sort of profound inherent connection with that jurisdiction. At common law, domicile is inherited through the father because at common law, there is a general principle that the child follows after the condition of the father. It can be difficult to ascertain what one's domicile is in the UK. Fortunately, in Hong Kong, we have a domicile ordinance. Right, and that makes it much clearer who's domiciled in Hong Kong and who is not. And domicile is relevant because it in, in the UK, if you're UK domiciled, then you pay inheritance tax on your worldwide assets, right? Even if they're in Hong Kong. You can live your whole life in Hong Kong and die. And if the UK revenue considers your UK domiciled, then it can attempt to tax your estate, right? So care must be taken in planning around that. Domicile is also relevant in ascertaining which kinds of family and succession law apply. This is particularly important in certain cases where an idiosyncratic, well, idiosyncratic only from a common law perspective, I suppose, but where an idiosyncratic, I would say, uh, succession law it might be engaged. So. Islamic su succession is something which is, is, is quite distinct from common law. And there again, domicile might be, might play an important role if one were domiciled, say, in Malaysia and will recognize as uh, 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 Bumiputra as a Muslim there, then I understand that certain provisions of Islamic customary law apply. Right, so again, understanding where one is tax resident and if relevant, where one is tax domiciled is very important. Uh, a final word on nomenclature. Uh, domicile in civil law context simply means your registered address, right? The ad your, your, your main address. So don't confuse too. When I use the word domicile here, I mean it in the tax context and as it's understood at common law. Next slide, please. So what now you've got your lovely collection what you want to do with it you can keep it in your home uh, or you can exhibit it and a lot of uh, museums may well be interested you know the museum industry in places like japan and china is booming if the load is for a fee and you learn out in Hong Kong, then that's probably that may well that was probably that may well be taxable. Depends if it's a one off or you do it constantly. If it's a one off, you can say it's miscellaneous or occasional income and accordingly not taxable in Hong Kong. If you do it systematically, then it would be difficult to resist the conclusion that you carry on the trade or business of loaning out artworks to museums. In other jurisdictions, if you loan artwork or, or, or antiques out to museums in other jurisdictions for a fee, then likely there'll be local tax consequences. You might find, for example, that you're paid net of local tax. It is, unless the sums involved are very minor, it may be worth 
checking with a local tax accountant in that jurisdiction to verify what your position is because most museums do not provide legal or tax advice they'll just say well you know you, you're responsible for your own filings and if you have any tax administration obligations in this jurisdiction that's for you to find out we can't assist you with that if it's on loan for free, you might want to consider other commercial concerns which arise in, in, in the course of that, of that kind of operation. So who covers the damage, risk of damage or loss? Um, is, is the artwork potentially sensitive when it comes to intellectual property rights or copyright? Is the artwork potentially offensive or obscene in that jurisdiction? Could it offend against any national security concerns? All of these are really are very, very important considerations. And again, museums, recipient uh, institutions uh, cannot advise. They may well have their own legal teams, but their legal teams are advising the museum, not you, the lender. So again, where a substantial work is involved, where a substantial amount of value is at stake, uh, I would always advise instructing local advisors to get a sense of what the liability profile is and certainly to review the loan agreement because the university will almost sorry give us i'm sorry the museum will almost certainly have its preferred form of loan agreement and it'll come as no surprise to you to learn that these loan agreements are skewed heavily towards the interests of the museum and not really towards your own so having a second pair of eyes over these kinds of agreements is always advisable. When there's an international loan, as I say, consider Lex Citus. What is the applicable law? Because you might find that you've got uh, an artwork, you loan it out to say Germany, something happens in Germany, and there is a dispute over which law applies. Is it the German law of property or the Hong Kong law of property? These disputes are incredibly complex. There is actually a branch of the law dedicated entirely to establishing which jurisdiction gets to assert its legal code over a given arrangement of dispute. It's called conflict of laws. In, in the ordinary course of business, yeah, nine times out of ten, this isn't relevant. But if you do have a collection or a particular item which you prize highly, which is very, very valuable, then it's always worth checking these points, even if only to obtain the, uh, the much sought after sign off, it's fine. All right, so next slide. Charities are wonderfully flexible tools and they can give a real durability to a good art collection because charities um, exists among other things uh, for the edification of the public, right? They are entities which are constituted exclusively for charitable purposes. Right? They, can't, they can't be for private profit, they are only for charitable purposes. And there are four main heads of charity, uh, the advancement of education, the relief of poverty, the advancement of religion and public benefit. In practice, in most cases, a trust or other entity constituted for the purposes of promoting the exhibition of art or artistic education or development of artistic taste will be for the advancement of education. That is charitable. A charities law tends to vary considerably across jurisdictions, but in common law jurisdictions, it's, it's all pretty much the same. And in most common law jurisdictions, the advance of education is full on charitable. The advance of education doesn't just mean school or university education, it can include the cultivation of artistic talent or the cultivation of artistic taste. Next slide, please. A charity, if you want, why you might ask, why do I want to set up a charity? Well, a charity is a great vehicle uh, for present providing continuity over time over a collection. Many museums are charities. Um, in practice, because uh, those which are free for entry, I mean, the British Museum, for example, is a charity. And that's why it doesn't charge for entry. So a charity may be organised as a trust or a company limited by guarantee. And a company limited by guarantee is exactly like a company limited by shares, only you can't buy and sell the shares. And that's because company limited by guarantee 
is not for profit making purposes it's for non profit making purposes they usually to uh, to manage clubs or charities or similar entities hong kong confusingly does not have a charities law we rely on mainly 19th and early 20th century english case law many other jurisdictions do have charities statutes but in hong kong we do not which can make advising on charities law in hong kong a bit problematic um, it's certainly i've encountered a number of very very difficult questions to arise and which could have been solved if we had a, a good charities legislation which we don't Charities in Hong Kong are good, they're favourable because they're exempt from tax. Right? So if you have a charity for the advancement of artistic education and all my previous tax comments in Hong Kong go away because whatever the, that entity is doing, it won't be taxed. Additional benefit of donations to the charity are tax deductible. And you could even have your own captive charity if you wanted to and you can make donations to it and you can claim tax deductions. And the minimum donation you get a tax deduction is $100 and up to a maximum 35% of your taxable income. So potentially very considerable deductions, tax deductions, which can be obtained. And of course, we all know the net effect of successfully claiming a tax deduction is that uh, your aggregate tax bill should be decreased. Okay, because deduction is from the amount of taxable income. Uh, in Hong Kong, we have a system whereby charities are acknowledged as tax exempt by the Inland Revenue Department. It's best practice to seek this sign off. It's, it's not terribly difficult to apply for this, uh, but the revenue can be rather difficult and prickly over certain things. And so approval can take anywhere between three to nine months. Right, depending on the complexity of the charity you have in mind. You can do it yourself, you don't need to be legally advised, but in cases which are a bit more complicated or with higher value uh, elements at stake, higher value items at stake, you may well consider instructing a lawyer or an accountant to assist you in that process. Next slide, please. What happens if you want to set up a private museum? You can, uh, you, you can constitute these as charities. And the, in my experience, the Inland Revenue Department in Hong Kong looks favourably upon free for entry uh, private museums, which are, which are charitable uh, and will likely treat them as charitable. And you, the, I recently advised, for example, on the opening of, uh, of the private photography museum which the revenue in Hong Kong recognises as being uh, charitable. And photography, of course, is, to my mind, it's art, um, albeit in different medium. Uh, we were initially concerned the revenue might take a very conservative approach and say photography is not really art, but they didn't raise any objections of that kind. So that was uh, pleasantly smooth for once. Uh, just because a charity makes a profit does not mean that it's not charitable. Right. You, you think about Oxfam. Right? Oxfam makes a profit because people donate clothes and they sell them at the low market value. So they generate a profit from that, provided that the uh, provided that the profit the charity generates is expended entirely for charitable purposes and principally in Hong Kong, it will remain charitable. So don't worry if a charity makes a profit. It can make a profit. Right, and that does not stop from being charitable. What distinguishes a charity from a commercial vehicle is that a commercial vehicle makes profit for private gain, and a charity can make profit for advancing its charitable uh, purposes. Uh, an interesting point here, very interesting tax planning opportunity. Artworks are technically plant. Uh, plant is part of the infrastructure one has to generate taxable profits. So that means that a for-profit museum, which is not a charity, and is therefore taxable, could in principle deduct the acquisition costs associated with furnishing it with artworks. And there's a recent case uh, in England in support of that. Uh, I, I'm sure many of you know Sir Joshua Reynolds, uh, who was an 18th century English painter, 
and he painted the very famous picture of Omai, the South Seas traveller, who was a Polynesian visitor to England in the late 18th century. And this was, I think, the second or third uh, highest selling English painting in history. And in this tax case, the High Court in England found that this, uh, this painting, because it was exhibited in the gallery, was plant. And so it was a bit like buying a machine for your business. It's something which you use in the course of the business and is therefore the acquisition cost and therefore is in principle tax deductible. So this is great potentially because, of course, by far the biggest cost in setting up a private for profit museum will be furnishing it with things that patrons would like to see. And in this case, of course, the asset was phenomenal, was worth a phenomenal amount of money. I mean, I think it was all sort of almost 10 million pounds, I think it was so for. But anyway, uh, that is something to consider for those of you who are, were ever toying or contemplating the idea of establishing a private for profit museum. Next slide, please. What are donations? Donations uh, to museums, to universities, to schools, uh, to other institutes of learning. A donation is a transfer by way of gift. Now, in, in America, it's very, very common for someone to say, you know, to tell, say, Harvard University, all right, I, look, I've got, a, you know, I'm a sinologist. I've got a lovely collection of, of you know, of, of Yuan Dynasty ceramics. You know, they're very nice monochrome. Look at this black eggshell effect. And I'm going to give them to you as to endow your turned out your your you know your your university exhibit on on oriental art but the condition is that you have to call this the stefano mariani wing of the harvard museum of oriental art that at hong kong law is not a donation at american law apparently it is I, i'm advised but at hong kong law it's not a donation that is simply a contract where you give your collection in exchange for getting a plaque with your name on it. It's not a proper donation. However, if Harvard say, thank you very much, we will spontaneously recognize you, then that is a donation, right? Because there is no element of bargain. They are so taken away by my generosity that they spontaneously and of their own volition and under no pressure whatsoever from me, decide to name the wing after me. I, so, <laughs> You can probably infer how in practice you can get around this rule in Hong Kong, right? But technically it can't be in the agreement, the, the, the deed of gift, the agreement by which you gift the property to the museum. Otherwise it's not a real donation and it's not a real donation. So you can't, for example, claim a tax, a deduction for it. Next slide, please. Sorry, next slide, please. Thank you. If you're ever going to make a significant gift, I'm not talking about $500 to a community chest, but if you have, if you want to gift your whole collection or a substantial amount of money, then it is critical to document it. And again, having a second pair of eyes over the deed of gift doesn't hurt. Museums, universities will have their own standard pro forma deed of gift. I know because I've written some of them, right? These are drafted from the donee institution's perspective. So they don't necessarily have the donor's best interest in mind. You may want to consider seeking independent legal advice, even if it's for a donation, right? especially if that donation is part of your broader estate or, or personal asset planning endeavors. Next slide, please. Uh, trust structures, as I mentioned, are efficient ways of getting around some of the strictures associated with this, with civil law jurisdictions. Uh, trusts are good for asset protection uh, because once you settle an asset on trust, your creditors can no longer recover against it. So, say you have a wonderful collection of uh, of, uh, of Ming vases, and uh, you settle it on trust, and something untoward happens in your profession and uh, your creditors come and sue you to and uh, you sue you for a debt they cannot recover against your collection your collection is safe because it is on trust 
If, however, it is comprised in your personal estate, then your creditors can recover against it and your creditors will almost certainly take the lovely collection of Ming vases and liquidate these for the money, right, to pay off your debts. So trust can manage your asset risk by effectively taking those assets out of your personal estate. Uh, trust can be effectively said in avoiding forced airship. You don't need to include assets which are on trust in your will, and there is no requirement for your heirs to apply for probate upon death because the trust has continuity in a way which a decedent does not. So a trust can continue long after you or I or anyone else has died. All right. Next slide, please. In setting up a trust, always consider risk allocation. How long do you want it to last? How long is it going to cost? Because you're going to have to pay a trustee if you want a professional trustee. How complex is it to administer? Will this give rise to litigation? Will your wife and children or your husband and children be dissatisfied with what you've done to the trust? Right? Is there an inherent disputes risk? And consider who the beneficiaries will be. Uh, beneficiaries could be your family members or it could be an educational institution, could be a museum. Right. Uh, so trust doesn't have to be for a specified relative. It can be for anyone for any entity, any person. And if it's a charitable trust, it can be for charitable purposes. That means you don't have to name a beneficiary, right? You just have to state for what charitable purpose this particular asset is held. But always consider cost benefit analysis prior to setting up a trust. In many cases, they're not necessary. And if they are necessary, then they need to be well thought out and structured and you need to get a sense as to what the trustee whom you wish to appoint can and cannot do. Next slide, please. Let's very quickly, we've got a few minutes left before I open the floor up to questions. But let's go through an example scenario, right? And this is, this is a case which I might encounter in practice or which other practitioners who deal with after law might encounter. Next slide, please. It's a, it, 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 it's a generic case, it's, you know, it's not, Mr. Gardner is not a real person, but for example purposes. So let's say Mr. Gardner is a renowned Japanologist and he has acquired in the course of his career a large collection of Arita ware, also known as Imari ware, which, some, which you will know much better than I do, was <clears throat> the kind of the Japanese uh, the knockoff of, 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 of Chinese porcelain, right? is kind of a substitute for Chinese porcelain, albeit in time it developed its own aesthetic identity. Uh, so uh, Mr. Gardner has got a pretty decent collection, which is accumulated over time. It's worth about 10 million US dollars. Uh, he's got about 90 pieces. So, you know, quite, 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 quite a substantial collection accumulated over a lifetime. Uh, so he resides in Hong Kong. Uh, he's verge of retiring. He's married to a Japanese lady, he's got two children. His two children don't care about Arita wear. Unsurprisingly, they have better things to think about. Right? They can't even Instagram it because no one is going to look at that post, right? No one wants to look at Arita wear. I do actually, I'm not a ceramic specialist, but I did go to Kyushu. Uh, I, I, I did, I, I did uh, go to Nagasaki, in particular Nagasaki and Fukuoka. I do, I, I do quite like it. I, do, I think it has its charm. It's unfair to call it a knockoff. It has a distinct aesthetic, whereas with Chinese porcelain. But anyway, that digression aside, Mr. Gardner wants to go back to England and retire to his cottage in Oxford, right? Or otherwise to Japan, uh, where his wife owns some property. Right? So he's looking forward to retirement and he wants to know what he's going to do with his art collection. And the only fully formed idea he has in his mind is that it be accessible to the public, right? He wants future generations to look in awe at his, uh, at, his at his collection, right? And he wants it to preserve it. And uh, next slide, please. And as a consequence, he has a number of options available to him. But in in, in evaluating his options, he needs to be aware of certain tax and asset planning issues. <clears throat> 
if he moves to England or he goes to Japan, there is a risk that all of a sudden his 10 million US dollar collection might be subject to uh, inheritance tax in his jurisdictions. So perhaps he might consider settling it on trust first, right? So as to take it out of his estate and hopefully uh, to avoid inheritance tax in those places. He might consider donating, donating it to a museum. All right, great idea. There are plenty of museums who might wish to take it on. The Nagasaki Prefecture Art Museum might want to take it on. Right? But what sort of documentation does he need? Right? The Nagasaki Prefecture Art Museum might say, well, you know, here's a Japanese deed of donation. Why don't you sign it? And he will be, even though he, Mr. Gardner, is no doubt a very fluent Japanese speaker, he's probably not a Japanese lawyer, and he might want a Japanese lawyer to have a quick look at it first. After all, it is his lifetime's work. Would there be any tax benefits for him in Hong Kong? No, probably not. But what about Japan? What about England? He needs to check those points because he might find that he's doing a good deed and he's also deriving a tax benefit. Win win. What if the Nagasaki Perfectional Art Museum says, well, you know, we love this collection very much and we want to set up a dedicated Arita Ware wing. Uh, so we'll buy it for you, we'll pay you uh, a million yen. And that's far, far below the actual value, but we'll still pay you a million yen. All right. Uh, so is any Hong Kong tax on that? Uh, almost certainly not. Any Japanese tax? Potentially there is. Uh, and he needs to verify that. Uh, what about double tax treaties? Can he get tax relief in one jurisdiction for tax paid in another? Right? All of these are factors which Mr. Gardner needs potentially to consider. What if they offer to purchase at market value? Well, the same as above, but this goes, especially because if they offer to purchase at market value, then that's a transfer of $10 million, potentially a very, very large tax bill if that is treated as a taxable receipt or a taxable gain in Japan or say in the United Kingdom. Because what happens if Mr. Gardner sells this when he's in the United Kingdom, he's UK tax resident, UK tax residents pay capital gains tax and income tax on their worldwide income and their worldwide gains. Right? That's the general rule. So again, potentially a very, very heavy tax bill, hefty tax bill for Mr. Garden to consider. So if he's well advised, he'll plan in advance and avoid these pitfalls and make sure that his collection gets to where it needs to be or it wants to be. Next slide, please. Asset planning, setting up a trust. If his marriage breaks down, he doesn't want his wife to get her hands on his lovely Arita wear because maybe uh, the, the divorce is very acrimonious and she decides to take a hammer to the collection or to her part of the collection just to spite him. You never know, right? What about what, what about Gardner's children? What if Mr. Gardner's children have very bad habits? You know, they might be compulsive gamblers and they say, well, you know, there's a lot of red pottery in father's study. Let's sell it so we can get some money and gamble some more. Can Mr. Gardner protect himself against that? Yes, of course he can. Uh, with, with a certain amount of planning, he can make sure that his children don't get his hands, uh, their hands on it, even if, say, he dies suddenly without a will. Right? And usually the way we'd go about doing that is by way of a trust structure. Uh, what if Mr. Gardner wishes to endow a ceramics wing at the Hong Kong Museum of Art? Again, he needs to consider is it a loan, is it a donation, who drafts the contract, who reviews them. And, and if he wants to set up a small private museum in Hong Kong, he could well do that. And the question then for him is, is it for charity or is it for profit? And if it's for charity, then you could set up a Hong Kong charity, which may well outlive him. Right? Again, after his death, he needs to find out who's going to fund it, who's going to pay the curate, who's going to pay the and who's going to pay the rent, who's going to keep the lights on. Well, those are all considerations, right? Which he with which he has to engage as a condition of precedent uh, in to disposing of the property. All right. Next slide. I think that's it. So we've run over a few minutes, but I think we've got about ten minutes to to take questions and to to discuss any matter which occurs to the attendees tonight.
Thank you so much, Stefano. That's that was an incredibly uh, rich and um, detailed talk. I don't think I fully understood everything. <laughs> um, it's very uh, technical, I think, in some points. Um, I'm very curious, um, just as a, a, an opener, because many of our members are uh, perhaps not collecting at the level that you're discussing. And um, they have personal collections that may not warrant the kind of treatment that um, uh, you're proposing. Um, in terms of obviously this has a lot of implications for um, uh, um, sort of inheritance planning um, uh, for um, and you know tax implications for um, your family members and your children and so on. But uh, are there provisions, let's say, sort of during your lifetime um, to do you do you have a as I know in the UK, there's a. Um, um, so if you wanted to gift in your lifetime so that it doesn't become part of your estate, so this is what this is what, what one issue that is related to inheritance tax. It's in a sense sort of how do you. Um, minimize uh, the, um, the 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 value of your estate in your own lifetime, um, and then I just wanted to comment. Um, by by the way, I just wanted to remind everyone that if you have any questions for Stefano, feel free to put them in the Q and A box, and we'll get to them uh, in a moment. Thank you. Um, I want I wanted to ask: Is there? You know, we can get to that in a moment. But I wanted to ask about. At what point should you consider setting up a trust? Um, because as I say, you know, many of our members are probably quite modest collectors. Um, uh, is there a sort of rough value of your estate? That's obviously a, a perhaps um, it can go up and down with fashion and it can be very subjective. Um, but is there a sort of value of your estate at, at which point you would consider it worthwhile to set up a trust, um, considering both the administration of the trust and the costs associated with setting up a trust. And um, it, I, I, I'm imagining that trust law actually, or um, the governance of trust, it's also not a static thing that requirements um, on how you maintain a trust and how you set up a trust and how it's um, managed are, are changing all of the time. Um, so is there a point at which you should really consider setting up a trust um, in relation to your collection? Well, that's a very good and commercial question, Tina. The, the, the short answer is no, uh, because trusts run the gamut from very simple to extremely complex and expensive. In essence, all a trust needs is a trustee and trust property and a beneficiary. That's all it needs. Uh, trusts over any asset except for land can actually be constituted orally. I can say I hold this pen on trust for you, and that's technically a valid trust. So even when the aggregate value of the trust fund is modest, if one is reasonably well informed and does one's own research, one can already set up a trust even without legal advice. Because then at that point, the likelihood of anything going terribly wrong, in any event, the, the risk exposure isn't great because the, the value of the collection is relatively modest. Now, as if and when the value of the collection increases, then the balance of convenience would move towards perhaps considering getting professional advisors or professional trustee. But there is no there's no real requirement that a trust be drafted by a lawyer. You can go on the internet, you can download perfectly functional trust deeds. And as long as it's properly documented, because ultimately you need the trust deed, the piece of paper saying that this asset is held on trust for probative purposes, you know, to, as evidence in the event this were ever challenged, if someone says, no, that's really mine, you say, no, here is a dated and witnessed piece of paper saying that this is held on trust. So you can start as early as you like. There's absolutely no threshold. Obviously, the higher the value, the higher the value, the higher the inherent risk. And as with any other risk assessment exercise, 
as the potential exposure increases, so too do the commercial reasons for which one might instruct professional advisors. Right, so it's a kind of sliding scale, but it's never too early to constitute a trust. And you can start off a trust as a very, very basic trust. And then in time, the trust can evolve and develop. It's a bit like a company. You can incorporate a company simply to, you know, to do very, very basic things. And if, if in time the business grows, then so too does the company's functionality. And so too does the range of, 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 of operations and transactions in which the company can be engaged. So I suppose that's some sort of long answer to the question, but no, there is absolutely no minimum threshold and no, there is no requirement for legal advice to set up a very simple trust. It may be prudent to do so, but this is in one of those situations like conveyancing where you probably need to involve a solicitor. Hmm. Um, just to sort of, I, I don't know if you answered this already, but just a kind of brief um, follow up to that. If, if you do set up a trust, um, as I understand it, um, that you, whatever you place inside the trust, whichever, whether it's your collection, whether it's a, a, another kind of uh, asset, whatever you place inside the trust, it no longer belongs to you. It belongs to the trust. And so um, you don't, you can't remove it from the trust um, unless the, the trustees all agree to that. Is that correct? Or, or um, uh, can you add to the trust? Is is what the trust owns or, or the assets that are placed within the trust something that can be um, flexible? It is flexible. Trusts are incredibly flexible and they okay. can pretty much cater for every situation you could imagine. You can certainly add the trust property and you can take away from it. Mm. Um, and it, it, there is a enough situation, for example, you might say, I want my collection to be held on trust for my two children and for me in such proportions and at such times as the trustee sees fit. And under those circumstances, I can potentially benefit from the trust if so required, right? but it's still not part of my estate right? because I've given it away on trust. Now, you have to be a bit careful because there are scenarios where you set up a trust and you say, I, you know, the, the trustee is a company which I own and control and, you know, I'm one of two beneficiaries and the other beneficiary really has no expectation of benefit. Under those circumstances, the law looks to the substance over the form and may well regard the trust fund as still being part of my estate. And that's because I have not, in effect, fully parted with it. But if you have a validly constituted trust, then the collection is out of bounds. And no one, none of my personal creditors can recover against it. Uh, the proper way of looking at it is it's owned by the trustee for the benefit of the beneficiaries. Right? Because a trust isn't like a company which can own assets, can't own assets, can't own property. It's a relationship for the holding of property. Right. So it's, it's property which is held legally by the trustee for the benefit, for the enjoyment, if you will, of the beneficiaries. Thank you. Um, in, in my other life, I'm a museum professional, so I'm going to put on my museum hat now and um, just imagine that uh, somebody decides that they wish to donate uh, something to the museum or they wish to bequeath something to the museum. Um, museums, especially depending on the kind of um, collection it is uh, and depending on where the museum is and the um, standard practice wherever the museum is situated, it can be incredibly difficult for museums to accept gifts, um, in part because of provenance issues, um, particularly in the United States, if you can't demonstrate um, clearly with, with um, um, documentation on where, when, uh, how you purchased it, it may not be possible to, to donate it. Um, the other thing, as we've seen from a number of museum collections, uh, Buffalo is one of the really standout examples um, where a, a gift is given to a museum uh, of which the collection area is not their core collection um, uh, focus. And so Buffalo was um, given a very um, a significant collection of Chinese art at some point, um, but it's actually a very well known, uh, the Albright Knox Museum. Uh, it's a very well known uh, museum of modern and contemporary art. Uh, 
and subsequently um, they uh, had a, a, a quite quite um, um, a, a famous deaccessioning of that collection, which may not have been in the um, you know in the wishes of the original donor. So I would say that uh, from a museum perspective, um, collectors who do wish for their collections to to be in the public domain. This is something that's probably best handled during your lifetime um, with all of the, the, the information that uh, Stefano has given about thinking about um, uh, donations and whether they are tax efficient, um, which jurisdiction you're in in the United States is highly tax efficient in the UK. I think it's quite tax efficient here. It's totally non tax efficient because um, uh, we don't have that uh, charities uh, structure. Um, I think that um, yes, it's it's best handled during your lifetime because then you can negotiate the terms of the donation, um, the way in which uh, and actually give a museum something that they really want um, and that will have a much better chance of being seen in public. Um, so uh, if there are no further questions, um, I don't know, Stefano, do you have any sort of uh, final points or things that you feel that you may have missed uh, in your talk um, no. or comments? If anyone has any questions, you can just write me uh, a, an email. I'm happy to discuss um, uh, sort of in passing anything which which might occur to you. Now, one thing I wanted to sort of just follow up very quickly on, uh, Tina, is you, you're entirely right. Uh, whether it needs to be during the lifetime, I mean, evidently one cannot manage things with a dead hand. Uh, that's a reality, it's a practical reality. However, I have seen testamentary dispositions where, for example, a will trust is constituted, that is a trust under a will. I have seen situations where during the lifetime of the set law, the person constituting the trust, uh, experienced third parties were involved at an early stage and after the death of the set law are in a position to shepherd uh, the, the collection of the assets in a way in which they consider that the set law might have desired. Obviously it is best to manage these things while living. It may not in all cases be possible and if it's not there are contingencies available. Uh, there, there, there may be suboptimal because as you quite rightly put it, nothing beats being there and being alive and being able to manage a process directly. Uh, if that's not possible, however, there are uh, legal contingencies, whether in a trust deed or in a donation agreement or a lease agreement or in a will, which can to a degree mitigate the risk of something going wrong further down the line. There may be clauses in the relevant donation agreement stipulating what happens upon reversion. If you have, for example, a, a collection which becomes problematic in a given jurisdiction, whether it can then be migrated to another jurisdiction which may not have the same issues. And this is something which we regularly build into trusts. So one example uh, might be, for example, one's unable to prove provenance, uh, where there is a challenge uh, from a potentially a previous owner or from a jurisdiction claiming ownership over the asset as part of its cultural heritage, then you know you might want to consider a redomiciliation or migration right in the event that event to a jurisdiction to a country which is friendlier in that regard but this can all be dealt with and it's part of the standard process of risk allocation which you would deal with when you come to either donation or loans a very good point um uh very very early on in my career when i was working in a uh, commercial gallery I came across a, a very unfortunate case of somebody who bought something and uh, had it shipped to another jurisdiction only to find that uh, when the object arrived in the other jurisdiction they were being um, they were under suspicion of having illegally exported it to the place that he had bought it from and then attempting to legally re-import it as a purchase into the place that he was living, which was Greece. And um, it was it was a very, very protracted, unhappy um, 
event. Um, so, so do take uh, professional advice um, with these things. Um, I, I would also just say that it's also important when you have collections um, that you uh, intend uh, to uh, pass on to family members or to institutions that you do undertake a regular um, audit, I guess. Um, and uh, in terms of uh, insurance valuation and so on, because I think it does happen that things change in terms of market value. And this happens um, according to scholarship, according to uh, fashion in some cases, and uh, the market. So it can be a little bit of a, a tricky thing to manage if you're not maintaining or aware of um, the value of your collection at any given time. So some uh, lots of food for thought and um, I'm incredibly grateful to Stefano for his time wow. and his uh, professional you, uh, views. It's been very, very enlightening I and mean, we have many, many more questions to ask, but um, uh, for this evening we are at time and I thank you all for attending and um, I look forward to welcoming you to um, some of our future events, obviously with uh, social distancing, we still have some limitations on in-person events, but I am happy to say that we will be um, having a, a preview of um, Bonham Spring Auctions on the 22nd of May um, and uh, look forward to welcoming uh, Dr. Lai Guo Long from the University of Florida to give an online talk about the role of Liang Sicheng and Lin Huiyin in Chinese heritage conservation. Um, and then in July, we are uh, delighted to be welcoming Dr. Wang Guangyu um, to uh, speak about uh, the wonderful exhibition that she curated on Chinese trade porcelains across the globe at the Chinese University on the occasion, finally, of the publication of her book. Um, so uh, I invite you to register for those events once those details are uh, available and those you'll be able to find on our website closer to the time. So thank you all this evening for joining and especially uh, thank you Stefano for your time this evening. <laughs>